Good evening. Welcome to Scarrett Bennett's Poets Corner this evening. We are glad you are here. I'm Donna Patterson and in charge of the Spirituality and Arts Programming. And we are delighted that we can meet this evening and have our guest poet, Leslie Lachance. It is exciting to, um, to be here. I want to tell you just a bit about Leslie before she comes up. And she is a poet, an essayist, and a teacher. Makes her home in East Nashville, Tennessee. And her poems are lyrical cartographies of every place she's ever been or wanted to be, real or imagined. Some of her poems and stories have appeared in Still, The Journal, Mead, Quiddity, Apple Valley Review, The Birmingham Poetry Review, The Greensboro Review, Juked, and other journals. How she got that way, her poetry chapbook was published in the quarter ed edition Mend and Hone from Toad Lily Press. I love these names. <laughs> Three of her poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize. She blogs about living with metastatic cancer at Sojourn and Stardust. She's a regular contributor to the East Nashville Magazine. And you can find Leslie on Twitter and Instagram at Fortuna Jones and on Facebook and her website, leslielachance.com. And her blog is Sojourn and Stardust, as I said. Again, I am glad that you have joined us for this evening, and um, I deeply appreciate all of your support for Poets Corner as we've done these throughout the, the years. And we do this because you help us with that, so thank you. And now, I want to introduce Leslie. Thank you all so much, and thank, thank you all for coming. Um, we have some tough competition. There's <laughs> a Rodney Crowell master class in the next building, so it's kind of exciting that, um, that we're here at the same time. Um, and um, I want to thank Donna also for organizing this and putting this together, um, and for Scarrett Bennett for, for keeping this event going as a regular way for poets to have a chance to share their work with their community. Um, and I've got friends old and new here tonight, and I've got friends, I think, um, watching on the live stream. So I'm, without further ado, I'm gonna read some poems. Um, and the first poem is not really a poem, not really a proper poem. It is, um, it is generated from a meme. It's, gen it's generated from a pep talk generator. Uh, anybody ever seen a pep talk generator? It was created by the Raccoon Society and they're a creative arts society and a pep talk generator um, gives you three columns with phrases that sound like they're coming from a pep talk. And you can arrange them any way you want and improvise. And this was really familiar to me because that when I used to teach Shakespeare, I had a, a Shakespeare profanity generator, a curse <laughs> generator that did the same thing. Three columns of Shakespearean curses that you could mix and match as appropriate to curse somebody out in Shakespeare in Shakespearean English. So this is better though, it's a pep talk. Um, so it's called, and the, so the poem's called A Little Pep Talk. Ace, your soul is made of diamonds and that's just science. Like how the wind shapes itself to love you in broad daylight as you are. Girl, boy, non-binary, trans, humans, as you are, know this. Your breath is holy smoke. Sweet thing, your brain has serious game. And your heart, 
that's always breaking, shimmers. Kintsukuri in gold repair. Okay. All right. Um, and kintsukuri um, is that is that practice in um, in Japanese artisanship where if a pot is broken, they mend it with gold. I think most people, poets sort of know about that. <laughs> know about that. Um, okay. So I come from the Hudson Valley of upstate New York and the Catskill Mountains. And um, so I have some poems about that. That geography, uh, that land has shaped me um, for my whole life. Even though I haven't lived there full time since 1990, I kind of go back and forth from Nashville um, to Saugerties, which is my hometown. Um, shout out to Saugerties. And um, uh, so I have, a, I have lots and lots of poems about that, and I've just brought a few tonight, because <laughs> um, I could bring a whole lot. But um, I should also say that I've organized this reading not really thematically. I've been reading a lot of poetry books that are about one thing, you know, a, a, you know, a book about a journey or a book about a healing. And my poems are kind of all over the place, but when I look at them, they organize closely, they organize themselves into little suites. So that's how I'm going to read the poems tonight. They're in little suites of poems. And so th these are my Hudson Valley Catskill poems. So this is Elegy for a Muddy Skirt. It begins with an epigraph from Mary Oliver's poem, Dreams. Finally, you have spent all the energy you can, and you drag from the ground the muddy skirt of your roots. Estuary brine, riverine muck, over bluestone bones, up to your marsalis shell, knees in it, birch dirt, sugar mapled, hayed and buried, dreamt in balsam pine, hawk hunted, hill bent, wild laurel, white pink bloom twisted through your spine, mere eroded plateau, not even proper mountain. Autochthon, Aquasasni, colonialist, immigrant, pointing your tongue, drawing back the bowstring of green lips across winter broken stone walls, collapsed barns, all the stilled mills, eel song on turtle drum, dream song or dirge. So keeping in the elegiac mode, <laughs> I see a lot of that seems to be elegiac. Um, this is Properties Pastoral. Um, and it's inspired by the dairy farm that my grandparents bought after World War II, um, where they farmed for a number of years. And the, the property is still in the family, and it's shared among cousins. Um, and we sort of all take turns uh, staying there. And we're all pretty sentimentally attached to it. And it's, and it's stunningly beautiful. Um, but there's always the tax man to pay. Property is pastoral. The deed, absurd abstraction. Meets and bounds, ridiculous. The tax man, also ridiculous. How about we measure the young cedars straying into the brambled pasture by the spring? Mark the hay wagon's height, tilted there, wheelless by the tipsy wall. Record how the gray boards shrink each season, splintering down through the thorns. The orchards invisible, the apples golden ghosts. Count the rustic vacation homes sprouting on the opposite ridge, harvest cattails, blackberries, wild blooms. Listen, jet plane. The Catholic Church was a very powerful force in shaping the culture of the Hudson Valley. And there were lots of um, convents and monasteries along the riverbanks, um, Catholic 
nuns played a large role in community education in lots of the small towns, river towns in the Hudson Valley, and mine too. And uh, I learned from the local parish priest that once upon a time, the, the nuns actually would come from a monastery on the opposite bank of the river, and they'd come by boat to teach. And in the wintertime, they'd come by sled and so I, so that started me imagining all of these nuns and all of the ways that they lived. Um, another feature of that time was that um, the the so the Hudson River is an estuarial river, and so fish run seasonally. And one of the big runs is the smelt run, which happens in March. It happens around the time of Lent. And I don't know if you've ever been to a, a smelt fish fry but it's, it's quite something, and, and the fish are delicious, and, the, and, the, and it's just, you, it's like eating potato chips. <laughs> They're just so delicious and crunchy. And um, I imagine what this would have been like in, say, like the late 1800s for a nun who, during Lent, you know, wasn't really supposed to be maybe enjoying her food all that much. Um, anyway, this is about the smelt run. Sister Agatha partakes, running of the smelt, March 1898. Barclay's men dip and heave their writhing nets, pour a thousand thousand tiny fish glittering upon the planks. Silver darts, smelt, salvation fish, I have heard them called, supper for spring's lean days, rivers chill to skillet. A March sky purples itself with night as children's games unfold at volume perhaps too full for Lent. Boys wild as water below the dam and hungry as they gather now about the boards heaped with fried and fragrant fish, oil and bone crisped. Folk hold themselves just long enough for Father Sweeney's grace, then devour tip to tail all, tip to tail, each smelt, one small bite, tiny bones, crunch, crushed, oils rolled slick across the tongue as I do now, eat, knowing plenty cannot be born without longing for more plenty, each bejeweled smelt miraculous. All right, so that's my little Hudson Valley suite. Um, okay. So in 2017, I was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. And it was a shock. I wasn't smoking. <laughs> um, I had a healthy lifestyle. Um, but uh, through the miracle of research and continued treatment, uh, I'm standing here in front of you today, and somebody with that diagnosis, even five years prior to when I had gotten mine, wouldn't have been, perhaps. So I have a, um, a, it's a type of cancer that's driven by a very rare mutation, and it is treated with a targeted therapy, and I'm the direct beneficiary of lung cancer research. So, and you'll probably see me online campaigning and fundraising in Lung Cancer Awareness a Month in November, um, but that's me. And so, I have a suite of cancer poems. I hope they're not too glum. Um, I don't mean for them to be, but this is, about, this is about living with the disease. So this is the before. The before, back then, plans made more plans, made generations, made entire family trees of plans, so many little plans. But not this one. Not this medicine list to tick, or more precisely this. A plan not to plan. We have evidence of planning, a photo from before, a weekend getaway. You can see me sporting a red and black checked flannel shirt for autumn and maybe a plan in my eyes, making another at that time. There were soap bubbles we blew on your birthday 
in the before. And we watched how each floated across the garden and burst above fading sunflowers. Today, I purse my lips into a plan and blow. Wonder if saying so makes a kind of curse or luck, my breath a floating globe. And this is Carpe Till No Diem's Left Behind. I'll gobble you up, days, pluck rough chunks with my poor tingled fingers, peel the calendared figment of you down to the sticky stuff, the nougat, sweet little pieces feed on you one by one by one, gulp your green heart, gulp your green heat and seasoned weather, all that wonder. From your gray gold dawn till your blue vesper dusk turns embered night whose sleekness I'll take in my frothy jaws and shake until stars come out falling tin and slick where pitch ends my politics and stalks the trees. Dark mocks the eye and caps my counted days as it's night I lick for comfort and light I crave. Be sure to arrive 15 minutes early for your appointment. Days fill in like a still pond, muck and duckweed, the hottest month for hummingbirds and humans in this southern city. We drag our thick selves to basement suites for radiation treatment number four of five on the ceiling above the cyber knife, that picture of a butterfly perched on a bloom. This is cure. 3 a.m. rain tantrums across my heaving dreams. Noah, I ask, is that you? I have two small dogs, male female, curled in the back crook of my sleeping knees and no future. But hope, twitching from noun to verb, seeds itself in memory slough, sprouts adventitious blooms, shaped like mice or microscopes, and beneath that peering eye, nature's tangled code unspools these shining threads. For Scythia, Wren, the season's first hyacinth, a hawk on the hunt, diving. I have had the occasion for immense gratitude um, as I have uh, lived with this illness. And this is one of those gratitude poems. Um, and it's called Neuropathy. I did not know how much world came through fingertips until the medicine cut their power down to dumb sticks. Earrings, shirt buttons, bra hooks, the onion skin pages in my little book of hours, small impossibles accumulate like debt. And yet, I hear my, my blind friend say, let me feel her fastening the small jewels chain around my breathing neck. Um, okay, it's not all sad. This is Matisse AC, or Maybe some of you know that Matisse had duodenal cancer. And he was treated and lived um, into his 80s or something. I don't know. Bad at biography, good at poetry. OK. <laughs> so this is Matisse AC. After the cancer, Matisse began paper cutouts, small pieces at first, then bigger, then murals, so many pictures made from pieces, goldfish, dancers, 
horses, famous people in portraits, these friendly spectaculars so beloved. Le bateau hung upside down at MoMA for 46 days, and no one said a thing until a stockbroker, imagine a stockbroker, noticed and told someone, and the newspapers made another kerfuffle about modern art. But I suppose boats may go any direction in space, which is, after all, where we live. Anyway, after the cancer, Matisse found a new way and went on until he died at 84. Heavy color, impossible shapes, bright, bright assembly, the blue nude doing yoga, endless flowers, those paper gardens bloom and burst in great curves, swaths of gouache and glue and going and going, Henri going and going, floating his own boat. And that's my little cancer suite. Okay, I have a little bit more time. That's very good. All right, so I have a couple poems about um, memory loss because that is real when you take an oral therapy every day or if you have chemo or radiation, especially if you have it on your brain, which happened to me. So my recall is pretty poor. Um, my husband can, tell, can make up stories about things I did. <laughs> I totally believe him. <laughs> you know, he's like, you just don't remember. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, um, and also there's a little bit of aphasia that comes with that. You know, when, when you thought of yourself as a person who is really good at words, it was like your one superpower. Um, and suddenly you can't find them or you can't remember them. Like I can't, I can't do poems from memory anymore. I used to do slam and I used to do poems from memory and they're really hard now. I just, I just, I don't even try anymore. The effort is kind of terrifying. So anyway, um, I've been writing, I've been got, I've gotten a little bit obsessed about this whole memory loss thing. So, <laughs> so this one is um, also, I think it doesn't, it doesn't help that we're bulldozing our landscape and landmarks because that's one way I remember how to get around, right? And, um, and it's creating this kind of cultural amnesia which, uh, which frightens and infuriates me. So um, this is about what I see when I drive through a part of northern Alabama on my way to see one of my BFFs who lives in Huntsville. And um, shout out to Rebel. And, and also, I think this, people see this everywhere they go now. So I think you'll, you'll find this familiar. It's called O oh Holy. O oh Holy Roller, rule me right here on Route 53 Radio Gospel Jazz Ardmore to Harvest, Alabama. Crush my, this used to be cotton, subdivision blood. Luscious space science can't save us now from amnesia. Peach orchards struck full of lightning and townhomes. Walnut groves, red dirt, golf course struck full of holy roller, air, and vocal omens. They shimmer up those last parceled out pastures like green birds busting down the sky. My girl and me, afraid of forget, we dig in, we dig in. Okay. Um, and this is one called Feathers and Oars. And this may still be a draft, but I'm, I'm going with it. Perhaps a storm in Florida has taken your good sense. 
the one upon which you built an empire before the plague of flowers dizzied us all from ordered thought. But who now will tend this hoard of paints and pens and books of good intentions and Latin left to learn? Resolve resolves to birdsong, house sounds at dawn, and your recent friends take all their glory with them. When they go, you complain. On your desk, Sanibel shells and collected feathers. In a corner by the door, an oar that Heather calls motif. It rose grief in the oldest elegies. Calamus, rachis, vain, parts of the feather. Oars have blades and locks, and you can still learn names, but can you keep them? When a man wishes to remember a thing, he should take some suitable yet somewhat unwanted illustration of it, St. Thomas wrote. Whatever a man wishes to retain in his memory, he must carefully consider and set in order so that he may pass from one memory to the other. The Beloved. Feather, moon on water, troubled by an oar. The beloved's ear, into which you have said every word that ever mattered. Okay, so those are that's my little mini memory soon. Um. Okay, and then my last category is poems that don't belong anywhere else. And I'm going to read a little from um, Mendenhone as well. So, um, got to see a show the other night um, that was pretty stunning. Um, just magnificent performances by all the musicians and all the vocalists. And this is that that performance, one of those singers. It's your neighbor. You know her. Jazz and blue, the way her voice sneaks up behind the notes, slides under syncopates, and tricks a lyric into stage light. Dust spin, gold shot song, shakes out feeling right at you. All musicians, musicians show up to listen. Crowd the club with their brimmed hats and button downs, clomp those hipster boots. Gotta hear the flower shop girl ghosting a little Billy, a little Ella, a little all her own thing on the mic. She's filled the stage with a week's pay in roses. Her eyes close into her sway curve of her lips shaping sound into dream, into longing. Um, I know there are some people in the room who know more about astrology than I do. Um, but I, I do know what a Mercury retrograde can feel like. And I think a lot of you probably can identify. Um, so even if you don't know anything about astrology, you'll know what a mer Mercury retrograde is. Um, I read this poem called Mercury Retrograde. Mercury Retrograde, you have brought me a cold and car trouble, my head full of pebbles and water, you scrambling planet hot little god of cocksure orbit and a handbag name, all merch and mayhem. You turn this day like a trick toward hell. Nothing works, not zinc, not the new fuse, not even love functions, you little fucker. <laughs> Sorry. You just feel that way sometimes. Okay. Um...
So I, I taught English. I'm teaching English, actually, again. But um, I've taught in the classroom for over three decades. And uh, I, to this day, I still find grammar incredibly slippery. If anybody thinks they've mastered it, just, just wait. It's a force of nature. It does, not, it does not behave. You can write all the rules around it you want, and the language is dynamic, and it just changes. So what I like to do is just fall in love with a feature of our grammar and just sort of dance with it a little bit, you know? Um, and so this one is, this poem is called Strange Little Enthusiasms, and this is about slippery grammar or syntax or morphology or whatever fancy word you want to use. Okay. So, strange little enthusiasms. Don't you love indefinite articles? So small, so full of possibility, and yet complete. A sturgeon, a spine, an opening wide enough for an armadillo or an egg. Once I had a dream in which grammar played roulette with a rigged wheel and a ball that never landed on anything. It was a sign, but I could not give up gambling on morphemes. So let's keep count of my winnings. A plum, a house, a person inside pulling a cork and pouring a glass of something red. We go for a walk. I tell you a secret. We make a pact. See how easy it is with just a few little words. A mouth, a breath, a long kiss, and then another. After, I write you a letter of introduction to an infinitive. Dear madam, I say, please give him a chance to explain. Um, this is a love poem, and um, it takes place on the front porch of Roanoke Faulkner's um, house in Oxford, Mississippi, after a very long St. Patrick's evening. It's actually the next morning. So, literary landmark, a valentine. Look, I found the souvenir picture of my hangover made the day after we declared our love and drank to it. One of everything Irish in the Irish bar. Remember? No? You took it the day after you'd proved your love with one hand holding my hair back and the other tilting the ice bucket to my chin while everything Irish emigrated. It was that afternoon, after coffee and eggs, after we'd found ourselves on the great dead writer's front porch with a pair of headaches, a camera, and go figure, a future. Okay. And this is a poem inspired by Dorothy Parker's poem, Resume. It's one of the poems I think I actually still remember. Do, does anybody know it? It's a, it's a satire of, on suicide. Razors pain you, rivers are damp, acids stain you, drugs, drugs cause cramps. Guns aren't lawful, nooses give, gas smells awful, might as well live. Not a pretty poem. I encountered it when I was, I don't know, very young. Um, the title of the poem is Resume. I didn't know what, I thought it was a resume. <laughs> Mom, what's a resume? So, nooses give. Aside from prayers and Mother Goose, the first poem I had by heart was Dorothy Parker's resume. Mother worried. 
but I fell for rhymes that clicked their way to fatality and snagged on that final shrug. Mad little might as well. One choice, almost as bad as the others. Okay. All right. And I'm gonna end with this poem. Um, it's inspired in part by um, by a line from Vyshlas Zimborska. So much world all at once, how it rustles and bustles. So this poem is called So Much World. <laughs> 